Lord God, as we celebrate the way you came into the world so long ago, and as we look forward to the time when you will come again, we ask you to come now. Be the living word that rests in each of our hearts. As we pray to the glory of your name. Amen. Well, in case you didn't notice, Advent has begun today. What is Advent? What, what does Advent mean? What's it all about? Sue, you can be quiet for a second here because I know you have. <laughs> Anticipation, waiting for the Lord. When? Anticipating him for when? For Christmas. Yeah. It is a time of, uh, you did it perfect, Becky. Preparation and anticipation, exactly what I had written here. It's a time for us to prepare to celebrate for when God came into the world as the man Jesus Christ. It's also a time of anticipation for us because we know that he's going to come again. And during this Advent, by the way, in my video devotions, I'll be looking at what the Bible tells us about when Christ will come again. So if that's something you're curious about, tune in. And I guess I just gave away what generation I'm part of when I said to tune in to a video <laughs> devotion. But in the midst of all of this preparing and waiting and anticipating, we need to ask ourselves a question. As the hymn puts it, what child is this? Who exactly is this Jesus whose birth we're about to celebrate? Who is this Jesus whose return we're expecting with great expectation? For my sermons this Advent, I'm going to try to answer that question based on what three New Testament authors tell us. Paul the Apostle, the anonymous writer of the book of Hebrews, and the Apostle John. So I'm going to begin today with what Paul had to tell us in his letter to the Colossians when he described to them who Jesus is. Now the Christians in Colossia lived under the power and the domination of the Roman Empire. And they also lived in a world that worshipped the emperor. The world they lived in said that Caesar is in control. Caesar is Lord. Caesar was ordained by God to rule. His dominion over land and sea is part of the cosmic order. Caesar is responsible for the blessings in your life. That's the world they lived in. And everywhere they looked, they saw symbols of Rome to remind them of the empire's power and authority. Now, we don't always recognize and realize how powerful symbols are. A symbol is more than simply something that stands for something else. Symbols capture our imagination. They help the message that the symbol is bringing come into our psyche more deeply. For example, our tree is decorated with chrismons. Every other year we talk about what the symbols mean on this tree. Each of these is not just something pretty, but it symbolizes something to help us understand God. What about the advent wreath? That's a symbol also, as each candle is lit. They told us that the, light we, the candle we lit today was the prophecy candle. We can wait till next week for the next ones. Or think about our Christmas Eve worship service. How many of you like our Christmas Eve worship service? How many of you like to come? Okay, those who didn't raise your hand, never mind. <laughs> we use the symbol to help us understand what it means for God to have come into the world. We use the symbol of light shining in darkness. And we do so with our candle lighting ceremony. That's where we end. We start with just the candles lit on the advent wreath and no other light. And then we gradually light our candles one by one until this room that was dark is filled with the warm glow of the candles. And we can see that that symbolizes what it means for Christ to come in the world. So let me ask you, if I said this year we're not going to do the candle lighting for Christmas Eve, what would you think? Mm -hmm. Something's wrong with you. Yes, yeah, something's wrong. No, I don't even want to come. See, that's what I'm talking about. That symbol is so important to us. We swim in a world filled with symbols. As an example, let's talk about all of the companies and corporations in the world around us. 
Do you, know, do you want to know what is the most widely recognized symbol in the entire world? Any guesses? McDonald's. It's not the cross. It's the McDonald's Golden Arches. Experts say that every day we receive between 5,000 and 12,000 messages from the symbols around us, from the corporations around us. Sometimes they're the commercials. Sometimes they're the billboards we see. But a lot of times you know where we see them. We wear them on our clothing. We have them on our shoes. We have them on our cars. I was talking to someone before church and she had Columbia on her jacket. <laughs> so there, that's what I'm talking about. They are all around us. And without even realizing it, they affect us. When you see what is that, what company is that from? Nike. You all do that. Just do it. But every time you see that Nike swoosh, you know what? It's putting a little bit more of a message in your brain. So that when the time comes for you that you want to buy a pair of sneakers, you're going to think, oh, Nike, I know them. I'm going to buy that. Our minds and our imaginations are being shaped every day by all of these symbols all around us. Just as the imagination of the Colossians was being molded by the symbols of the Roman Empire. Now the messages that we're receiving are not to worship an emperor. The messages we're receiving are to do what? Buy, consume. And that's especially important this time of year when we're starting our annual frenzy. Anyone here do some Black Friday shopping? And then in the midst of all of this, we find Paul's letter to the Colossians, which gives us a very different message. The part of Colossians that Heather read for us was actually a poem. In fact, it was probably a song. And if there's one thing that can get into your brain more deeply than a symbol, it's music. If you set something to a melody, you'll remember it. How many of you know what an earworm is? What's an earworm? It's a song that never leaves your head. Yeah, it's a song that is in your brain you just can't get rid of, even when you want to. So that, I think, is why Paul wrote this as a song, because I want you, in the midst of all of these symbols around you, I want this message to come into your head. And it begins by saying the Son, that is Jesus Christ, is the image of the invisible God. In other words, Christ is the symbol that we can see that helps us recognize the almighty God whom we can't see. But when Paul says that the Son is the image of the invisible God, he's not just saying, oh, he's just a symbol like, you know, the target, the bullseye is a, target, a symbol for target. No, he is saying that he is the exact representation. Later on in the poem, he says, God was pleased to have his fullness dwell in him. Do you know what that means? That means that what makes God God, that's who Jesus Christ is. Hebrews chapter 1 says the same thing when it says the Son, again, that's Jesus Christ, is the radiance of God's glory and what? The exact representation of his being. If you want to know who God is, look at Jesus. By the way, in the Gospel of John, Jesus says that over and over again. You've seen the Father because you've seen me. Later on, Paul writes, he, again, that's Christ, he is the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created. In Christ, everything was created. And that was a slap in the face to the worship of the Roman emperor. Because they said, Caesar is the beginning of all things. He is the beginning of life and vitality. And we say, no. Everything was created in Christ. But this is something that we Christians, we who claim Jesus Christ as our Lord, this is something that we don't always recognize. Sometimes we have this idea that Christ, the Son of God, did not exist until Mary gave birth and put him in the manger. No, that is when the Son became incarnate as one of us. But God the Son has been from the very beginning. Now, sometimes we divide the Trinity. I know the Trinity is a real hard concept to wrap our minds around. 
But so sometimes we divide them up into parts, where we say the Father does the creating, the Son does the redeeming, the Spirit does the sustaining, but that's not what we believe. We believe that all three persons of the Trinity are part of everything. And back at creation, the Father created. We know in Genesis that the Spirit was hovering over the waters at creation. And the Gospel of John tells us that through Him everything was made. Nothing was made that was not made with Him. This Christ, this Jesus Christ who we worship, this Jesus whose birth we're preparing to celebrate, this Jesus whose Lordship we honor, this Jesus whose redemption we live by, this Jesus whose return we anticipate, this Jesus is the Creator. And you can't express it any better than the words in Colossians. For in Him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through Him. Oh, but he goes on. Not only was it made through him, but it was made for him. All of this creation was made for Christ. Not for us, not for other people. This has all been created for Jesus. Jesus is the reason why we exist. We exist for his glory. We exist for his love. And that is why Paul says... In him, he has, in everything, he has the supremacy. Everything. Christ is supreme over everything, including Caesar. So he's not worth much of anything. He is supreme over everything that deluges our brains vying for our alliance. You know, all those brands that we see that are saying, by us, we're the best. No, he is supreme. What about those politicians who say, hey, we can solve all your problems if you elect us? What about the sports teams that say, hey, cheer for us. Let us be the ones that you're most excited about. What about our nation? Many people have fought and died for. What about your family? Which for most of us, many of us, is the heart of who we are. What about our very selves? Are any of these supreme? No, because it is God has made Christ himself supreme. The Father exalted Christ this way. God filled Jesus with his very identity. And he did it so that through him, he can reconcile all things to himself and he can bring peace. Christ came to reconcile us, to bring us back into alignment after everything has been twisted and corrupted by sin and brokenness and everything else. Christ came to make peace for us all to be once again under his authority where we'll know the fullness of life. He came to reconcile and to make peace through his blood shed on the cross. Now, if you're paying attention that last line should come as a total shock. This whole time, we've been talking about how Christ is supreme over all of creation. He was before all things. He created all things. He is the reason why creation even exists. And how does he bring peace? How does he reconcile a world that has been distorted? How does he bring all things back to what they were designed and destined to be? Huh. This image of God this fullness of his being, this Christ who is supreme over everything. He is the one who shed his blood on a cross. The concept that this Christ, who is the creator of all, who is Lord over all, the concept that he would even give his life for us is astounding enough. But he did it on a cross. Now, I've been talking about symbols, so let's talk about the cross as a symbol. For us, a, the meaning of this symbol has changed over time. For us, a cross is a symbol of our faith, of our piety. The cross is a symbol of what we believe and 
who we believe in. That's why I'm wearing this cross around my neck. That's why we have that big, huge cross on the wall behind me, to remind us of who it is we believe in and what we believe. That's what the cross means for us. That's not what the cross meant for the Colossians. For them, a cross was the symbol of terror and horror and torment. It was the most humiliating and agonizing way the Romans could come up with to kill someone. Unfortunately, I think humanity might have gotten more creative. There might be worse ways now, but back in those days, it was the worst. And death by crucifixion was reserved for the worst of the worst. It was the way that Rome displayed its power over the empire. The crosses were things that Romans used to intimidate people, to tell them, this is what you will face if you defy our power. That's what the cross meant for the Colossians. So, when we hear that this eternal son, for whom all things were created, he wasn't forced to die on the cross. No one made him do that. He chose to die in this horrible way for us. There are two immense concepts here for us to try to wrap our minds around. And the only reason they don't astound us every time we think about it is because we've become numb to it or we fail to understand what they mean. First of all, Christ is supreme. He's supreme over all of these other things that are chattering for our attention and for our allegiance. And second, this Christ who is supreme died an awful death to set creation right. Now, some of you might be thinking, okay, well, that's nice, that's cool, all right, so I've learned some facts. But you know what? This is not some grand theological, theoretical concept I'm talking about. This is immensely personal. You were alienated from God. You fell away from the place that you were created to be. But now you have been reconciled. You have been brought back to the place where you belong under the love and lordship of the Son. And it happened for us through that unimaginable death on the cross. For all of creation, yes. But for you, personally, individually. What does that mean for us? How do we respond? Well, Paul goes on in his poem to tell us. Continue in your faith. That is, continue to rely on God. Continue to trust in Him. Continue to put your faith in Him. Let Him be the foundation of your life so that your faith is established and firm. And do not move from the hope that we have in the gospel. Do not move from the knowledge that we have that Christ's reconciling work is continuing. The hope that we have will be fulfilled when all of creation is once more brought under Christ's supremacy. And that is how we will know peace and joy and love and everything else that makes life worth living. We will know it because then we will live the lives that we were created to live. Would you pray with me, please? Lord Jesus, so often we forget. We paper over in our minds who you are and all that you have done. So once again, Lord, today, receive our humble praise and our adoration as we sing our praise to you.